Greetings, everybody. Uh, my name is Tyler Friedman. I'm the Associate Curator of Contemporary Art at the Museum of Wisconsin Art. And I'm delighted to be here uh, virtually, as the case may be, with Dennis Kitchen, uh, the co-curator of Wisconsin Funnies, 50 Years of Comics, along with myself and our and Jim Danke. Um, Dennis is a man who really needs no introduction if you're a comics fan of any capacity, but we're going to be getting a, a, a very robust introduction from Dennis himself with a short and cheesy history of Dennis Kitchen. Uh, before we get the show on the road, I wanted to thank again the Wisconsin Humanities Council for supporting the exhibition and this virtual programming, as well as the Wisconsin Department of Tourism, the National Endowment for the Arts, James and Karen Hyde, Pick Heaters, and the Wisconsin Arts Board. Thank them very much for making the exhibition possible and all the programming surrounding that. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand it right over to Dennis. Well, thank you, Tyler. Um, I originally was supposed to be doing this live in Wisconsin and uh, some something interfered with that, that interfered with everything in our life. So we're doing it long distance. I wanna start by quickly thanking everyone at the museum who's been a great help at every stage of these events, especially Tyler and Jennifer and Allie and Lori, and also my cohorts, Paul Buell and Jim Denke, without whom this would not have happened. Um, and for all of those who are turning in this evening, uh, thanks as well. It's not easy to cram a, I think a 52 year career into about a 40 minute uh, slideshow, but I'm gonna give it my best. Um, wanna start with a, I think a cogent Robert Crumb cartoon. This is a postcard he did of a classic 1950s mother tearing up a kid's comics. I was born in 1946, so I was a child of the 50s, and I grew up at a time when comic books were not only hugely popular in America, but also hugely controversial because comics uh, of all kinds were being produced, from the funniest kind of Disney comics to the most outrageous horror and crime comics, and there were no age uh, indications on them. Anybody who was eight years old could walk into a drugstore, plop a dime down, and walk out with whatever comic they wanted. And uh, a lot of them were, you know, pretty wild. If you were a, a parent uh, at that point, you might be uh, a little upset too if a young child brought home certain comics. So I was lucky I trained my mother early on to uh, leave my comic books alone. And in, in trade, I had to keep my room neat. So that was easy. I read all kinds of comics. Uh, Little Lulu and Uncle Scrooge were among my favorites, and I read the superheroes like Batman and Superman as well. But I noticed in most of the comics that were published from about the mid 50s on, up in the upper right hand corner, there was a very annoying and puzzling symbol called approved by the Comic Code Authority. And the comics that had those turned out were a lot tamer and a lot less interesting than the pre-code comics, basically, which were uncensored. Comics industry came under a great deal of pressure in the late 40s and early 50s, led mostly by some indignant parents, parents groups, a prominent psychiatrist named Dr. Frederick Wortham, and even uh, Estes Kefauver in the Senate uh, pulled together a, a Senate investigation into comics. So it was a tough time for the comics industry, and the way they addressed it was they came up with a self-censoring board called the Comic Code Authority. But for readers like me, that was, uh, that was not uh, welcome. Um, among the kind of comics, I'll just show you a couple of quick examples that I really liked were the crime comics, which were often pretty gory and creepy. And especially I like the horror comics. And here's a particularly uh, favorite one of mine. Um, so if you're, you know, at the time I was reading this, I was probably about, uh, nine or 10, maybe 11. And it's the kind of thing that can give you kid nightmares, I suppose, but you know, we liked that they were creepy. We liked that they were spooky. And uh, the Comic Code Authority, to me, I wouldn't have known the word emasculate back then, but that's what it did to comics. And it was very frustrating. One of the few things that survived because it wasn't a comic book, it was a magazine, was mad. And Harvey Kurtzman's Mad comic and then magazine was a real delightful ray of uh, 
inspiration for those of us reading comics at that time. This uh, particular example is a great Jack Davis uh, cover. It's uh, showing a classic crowd scene that you could look at for hours and still see things, surrounded by a classic Harvey Kurtzman border. Um, so much detail went into those that for the quarter you paid for it, you know, the, the cover itself pretty much uh, <laughs> was worth it. I was drawing comics early on. I can't even remember exactly when, but certainly by the time I got into high school, I was pretty serious about it. And every single assignment I got, I would turn into an opportunity to cartoon. So when we had to do any kind of term paper for any class, I would illustrate it. This particular one, I don't even remember what class it was, but I postulated, uh, will the Braves win the pennant in 1963? As you can tell from my illustration, uh, the Braves uh, then were an aging team and no, they did not win the pennant. Um, for one of our classes, we had to do a, a paper on a potential occupation. And I knew in the back of my head, I really wanted to be a cartoonist, but I had no idea how one went about doing that. I didn't know any cartoonists. I didn't know how to find out anything about it. The counselor in high school was worthless in that regard. So my uh, relatives pressured me to become an engineer because I had a successful cousin who was an engineer. So I was like, all right, all right. So I did a paper on cartooning versus engineering. And um, in this booklet, for the purpose of pleasing the teacher, I came out in favor of engineering. But of course, in truth, that's the last thing I wanted to be. And I'm so glad you know, I ended up going to the field I did. But again, there was no path. There were no schools then as there are now for would-be cartoonists. So I did what I could in high school and again, took every opportunity. This was some local press I got in the Racine paper uh, uh, at Christmas time in 1963. Each homeroom got to decorate its door. So I was chosen to decorate uh, my homeroom door. And if you can tell from this uh, detail, it looks superficially like a very Christmassy thing. I'm drawing a Christmas tree with ornaments. In the background, there's a chorus singing, peace on earth, goodwill to men. But if you look underneath the tree, all the toys and presents are uh, weapons of destruction. Guns, pistols, submachine guns. So that was one of my first efforts at satire and being able to get away with it. And uh, I actually even won a prize for, for that, uh, not to mention the publicity. So all of that was very encouraging. I also put out what you might even call an underground paper in uh, grade school and high school called Klepto. Uh, it got its name Klepto because classmates used to steal it. And I, so I, I, I thought I'm surrounded by kleptomaniacs, so that's what I'll call it. It lasted 25 issues, I think. Uh, if you can read the uh, detail here, it was a nickel, back when a nickel was uh, was worth something. And I sold anywhere between 50 and 100 copies to classmates. I wrote it, I drew it, I typed it, I mimeographed it, thanks to a sympathetic uh, uh, secretary in the principal's office. And um, it was a great, for me, preliminary path to becoming a professional cartoonist and a publisher because I got to wear a lot of hats. Um, it was successful and popular and I used to think it was because I was a great cartoonist and writer, but in truth, I think it's because the one thing I didn't do in Klepto was a gossip column um, by a classmate who didn't want to be named, so I called her Miss X, and it was all gossip about classmates. And it turned out, really, that's what sold it. It was the scandal rag, and I was just window dressing. But nonetheless, great experience. I got out of high school. My timing was perfect. I segued right into what we now look back and call, you know, the, the hippie movement. Uh, <clears throat> at the time, um, we didn't call ourselves hippies. It was the counterculture. Uh, it was the anti-war generation, and um, I was caught up with it philosophically. I grew my hair long. Every hippie has an embarrassing photo. This is mine. Looks like I'm auditioning maybe for a film role of a young Ming the Merciless or Fu Manchu. I don't know. Anyway, that's what I look like then. 
my apartment on the east side of Milwaukee was a second floor walk up and uh, the walls were bare. So I fixed that. I started painting ultimately every square inch of that hallway because why not? Um, the uh, building got bought by a new landlord who came to meet all the tenants and he came to my place and he was aghast. <laughs> I guess understandably. I uh, next time I saw him, he came with a painting crew, and they covered every square inch that I had adorned. So I confronted him and I said, "I can't believe you are destroying my artwork. This is this is wrong." And he said, "You're upset. It took me three coats to cover it." So we were both indignant. This is the car I drove. I had a 1949 Nash. Um, built, I should add, in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And uh, I proceeded to paint it that summer uh, in Paisley. This is unfortunately a black and white photo, but I do remember I had 14 different colors of enamel. It's about halfway finished here, and uh, it was pretty outlandish. On the roof, you can't see here, but I actually had a topless mermaid and uh, I figured only bus drivers or truck drivers could look down and see it. So that was my hippie vehicle. I was a card carrying hippie, no question. What was happening on the West Coast was a movement that came to be known as underground comics, started by one Robert Crumb in San Francisco with Zap, the comic that plugs you in. And uh, what was happening was this whole counterculture movement was uh, creating its own look, obviously, its own politics, which were very anti-establishment. And it was creating its own media in the sense, first, of underground newspapers that were spawned in just about every major city and college town. And the next step was comics, because the cartoonists of my generation who wanted to express themselves decided, why not express ourselves in our favorite medium, which was comic books. Robert Crumb wasn't technically the first, but his was the first to really catch on and get a national notoriety. And it was a big influence on all of us. My first effort, which was uh, created in late 1968, was Mom's Homemade Comics. Originally, this was part of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee humor magazine, Snide, that I had co-founded, but the second issue was going to be an all comics issue, but the editor, the co-founder, uh, took off with the $800 treasury we had. And so I was left with a bunch of comics pages and I decided what the heck I'll self publish it. So I found a printer in Milwaukee. I printed 4,000 copies, which was what I could afford. Um, I called it Mom's Homemade Comics just as a crazy setup to the punchline, which was the subtitle straight from the kitchen to you. And uh, at the bottom it says, bold blustering tales of stark passion featuring the vitriolic belly splitting humor of Dennis Kitchen. I don't know that it delivered on that, but it was my first effort and I sold 3000 copies, uh, astonishingly enough, just on the east side of Milwaukee. The other 1,500 got shipped to San Francisco and 500 went to Woodstock when my roommate Terry drove out there. He was supposed to sell them for me, but he dropped acid and ended up <laughs> giving them away to 500 or so, uh, I hope, appreciative uh, hippies. This is me uh, taking uh, the comics out of an oven because, of course, it's straight from the kitchen to you. And this was a, a marketing idea that actually ended up getting some press. My hair is on the short side here because uh, a few months earlier, I had been drafted into uh, the U.S. Army. I spent 22 days in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, but that's the subject of a, an entirely different slideshow. So here I am on my way back to being a hippie again and basically self-publishing. Uh, for those of you who don't really know what underground comics are, this page, I hope, kind of sums it up. This is... Uh, uh, not a hippie. Looks like maybe it could be a Wisconsin farmer. And he says, uh, hello, friend. This year magazine is an underground comic book. Of course, it ain't no smutty book what uses F asterisk CK and P 
pecker and tit or other nasty words with asterisks. It's just a hard hitting satire type magazine what tackles controversial subjects like the war in Vietnam with asterisks, contemporary morals, economics, and Baptists. Can you dig it? And my point here was, unlike the previous generation or two that was concerned about things like four letter words in comics. To my generation and to me, it was the war in Vietnam that was the obscenity, that was the point. And so comics became our vehicle and we didn't have a comic code authority. We could say whatever we want and we did. Um, shortly after starting the comic company, I also co-founded the Bugle in Madison, Milwaukee. Did many covers, this is just one of them. Uh, in the window, you see a woman of ill repute who yells out, hey, how about a little affection, big boy? French pleasures. The dealer in the middle window says, how about reefer, THC, LSD, MDA, NRA? And the revolutionary in the third window says, Molotov cocktails, ammo, nitro. But the young boy with the big W on his chest says, none for me, thanks. I also did a strip every week along with four other cartoonists like Jim Mitchell and Bruce Walters and Don Glassford and Wendell Pugh. Every single week we did one. This one, uh, the title isn't on it, but it was called ASPCA Funnies. And I'll show it to you panel by panel so you can see it easier. Guy walks into the Humane Society. I want an animal. There's a fine selection in that room, sir. So he looks over the options comes back and says, I'm taking this animal. And she says, I'm sure you'll give it a nice warm home. And he does. So again, some people might think this isn't funny. I thought it was funny. I still think it's funny. And I love animals. But humor is a kind of thing that you, you, know, you either get it or you don't. And um, we were deliberately outrageous. And we were doing a lot of jokes that perhaps were preceded by a whiff or two of, of pot before we drew it or before our readers read it. So they were not the kind of comics you'd find in the Milwaukee Journal Green Sheet. They were our own. My cohorts at that time uh, are best shown here in uh, a one-of-a-kind uh, jam self-portrait, uh, which is the Milwaukee-Chicago axis of underground cartoonists, all of whom are represented in the museum's two exhibits in West Bend and Milwaukee. Um, on the top from the left is me with my still uh, Ming the Merciless beard. Next to me giggling is Don Glassford. In the middle is Jim Mitchell with his character smile on his shoulder. On the far right is Skip Williamson from Chicago. On the far, on the bottom left is uh, smoking is Jay Lynch from Chicago. And then the balloon-like figure is Bruce Walters, also known as Bruce Van Olten. And then finally, uh, Wendell Pugh with the Repitograph Stigmata, I guess. So we were the, the core group, but there were others who joined us from time to time as well. Um, Milwaukee and Chicago turned out to be the big uh, concentration of underground comics outside of the San Francisco Bay Area for reasons that might be hard to understand or explain, but it's the truth. Nobody else, not New York, not no place else. Milwaukee. I called my company Kitchen Sink Press. Uh, the umbrella organization was Krupp Comic Works, but Kitchen Sink Press was always the publishing arm. Uh, this is a poster that Pete Poplaski drew, same artist who drew the museum poster for Moa Funnies. This was a uh, poster we give to the retailers to put in their window to make sure passersby knew that they were a high class establishment because they carry comics with an X. And there you see a couple of customers uh, laughing their brains out and long line behind them. I also got to know early on Robert Crumb, who was based in San Francisco, but who made uh, ultimately numerous trips to uh, Wisconsin. Uh, he was a 78 RPM record collector and I was a 78 RPM jukebox collector. So it was love at first sight. We actually went hunting for records in places like Port Washington and uh, Sheboygan. Uh, we're sitting there in uh, Dave Schreiner's uh, Port Washington porch, as a matter of fact. 
Um, becoming a publisher was something that was a bit problematic for me. For one thing, I was at that time a card carrying socialist and I didn't really like the idea of being a businessman, but out of necessity, I felt I had no choice. And at the same time, I really wanted to be a cartoonist. So that kind of schizophrenia was best represented by this dual self-portrait of me yelling at myself, you're behind schedule kitchen. Yes, Mr. Kitchen. So some days I had to be the suit. Some days I got to be the artist. Still kind of that way today. One way I <clears throat> dealt with it was through satire. This was a page I did in an early issue of Snarf called Let's Be Honest. So it's me talking about being a publisher. You may think that being the head of an underground publishing company is a lot of fun. Well, let me tell you, it's not. Bring. It's a supreme hassle is what it is. Excuse me. Bring. Hello. Hef. Hey, how you doing, baby? Tonight? Listen, why don't you come here? Sure. I'm bringing a lot of girls. Yeah, later. Like I was saying, it ain't a barrel of monkeys. For instance, I have to slip out of my comfortable suit into these bell-bottom jeans because some cartoonist is coming in with a new underground comic book. He's here, Mr. Kitchen. And this is supposed to be a caricature of Crumb. Hey, what's happening? Got a new book here. Groovy. Can I get an advance? Well, times are tough, but I'll tell you what. Here's a 20 out of my own pocket. Dennis, you're a saint. Miss Cheever, have Higgins bring the limo around. Get this book to the presses. Have him run half a million and wire this to my Swiss account. I got to run now. Yes, sir. I tell you, Hef, publishing is a real fucking hassle. I know what you mean. So that was the way I made fun of it. Another uh, important person I met early on was Will Eisner, who was already a legend in comics when I met him in 1971 at a New York comic convention. It was my first, and this was a, a caricature I did later of what we both looked at at the time. Um, Will's the one who's bowling in a three-piece suit. Um, we really did look diametrically opposite, and not to mention we were 30 or so years apart. But we really hit it off because we shared a mutual passion for comics. And Will was among the very, very few in his generation who had argued uh, – to basically empty walls that comics had the potential to be a, a serious uh, literate art form. And he was never taken seriously, but he saw undergrounds as the way to start breaking through, to start basically demolishing the idea that comics were just for kids. The comics were just a medium that could be used by anyone and could be used for serious intent. So we shared that in common. I ended up not knowing it from this first uh, meeting, but I ended up being his publisher for another 30 years or so. And he became a close friend and in many ways a mentor to both my business and me personally. And I uh, was always very grateful for that. First thing I convinced Will to do was a guest cover for an issue of Snarf, in which he showed his famous character, the spirit, breaking down the door to the Krupp Comics office with uh, Commissioner Dolan from the Spirit. And what he reveals here, tongue in cheek, is that uh, it really is an underground publishing company. It's literally underground. We're working uh, waist deep in uh, a Milwaukee sewer. <laughs> uh, hippie on the left is saying, uh, how do you spell uh, defecate? So I loved it because uh, Will got to make fun of us. We were making fun of everyone else, including his generation. And uh, no one we thought should be immune from humor, not even us. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, which is somehow not spelled right there, was kind of the cornerstone of, of content. Uh, this is probably my most infamous cover, the giant penis that invaded New York. Uh, my youngest daughter teases me that uh, a three-dimensional version of this is going to be my gravestone. So we'll see. <clears throat> In any event, this was an example of outrageous comics. Uh, newsstand comics would never, never, ever, ever show, you know, a penis on its cover. And this isn't really either. It's a cartoony penis. And so I got away with it. This was one of our best sellers. No one ever, no one ever sent them back. No one ever busted us. 
it's the way it was back in the 70s. Dope Comics was another popular series. Uh, I use this example, too, because it's a cover by Leslie Cabarga, and it shows that stylistically you can't really pigeonhole what we were doing either. This is Leslie doing a parody of the Fleischer Brother cartoon style from the 1920s, very animated look where you have a an evil spider forcing uh, some strapped-in bug to smoke this giant joint. But fortunately, a bee man is on the way to rescue him. So it was tongue-in-cheek. Uh, the title Dope was right in your face, but it really was cartoonists talking about their drug experiences, and they weren't always necessarily pleasant. It was just mostly autobiographical material about our generation. Uh, this is a page I did for Dope Comics where I say, the values of grass are many and varied. It is perhaps most useful as an inspirational tool. Some of my best ideas have come to me under the influence of this drug. Oh, wow, I just got an idea for the greatest comic in the history of Western civilization, Flash. And, of course, you know, those ideas never stuck. As soon as I come down, I'm going to knock it out, sure. But marijuana is also known worldwide as a potent aphrodisiac. Flick out the lights, mon petit. It's time for l'amour. It's only fair to warn you. One joint will sustain me for 48 hours. In the rock and roll category, I got the license to do the official Grateful Dead comics, which was fun for a while. Uh, I think we did about nine issues um, where the audience of the Grateful Dead overlapped very neatly with the audience for underground comics. We got to hang out sometimes with a guy named Jerry Garcia. That wasn't a typical day. But mostly we stuck to humor comics. Mr. Natural, one of Crumb's more famous creations, was an example of just funny comics. Um, my humor line was anchored by a Snarf series. This is Crumb doing a, a cover of a, of a mad scientist fighting the big companies with good old American know-how. This cover is by a guy few people heard of at the time named Art Spiegelman, who went on to win a Pulitzer Prize for Mouse. This snarf cover is by Will Elder, who was one of the longtime MAD contributors and collaborated with Harvey Kurtzman. Uh, this uh, is one of the many uh, originals in the museum if you attend the shows. Uh, Will Elder was a big fan of uh, a painting in the Louvre called uh, Raft of the Medusa by Theodore Jericho uh, about shipwrecked sailors. So Will Elder took the composition and uh, instead of the uh, forlorn sailors. He put the forlorn survivors of the hippie generation, which again, uh, humor at the expense of my tribe, but uh, I'm fine with it. Again, uh, no sacred cows for us. Snarf was successful enough that I did a spin-off I called Mondo Snarfo, kind of after those uh, Italian movies, uh, Mondo, what were they? I forget. So this one was a deliberately, uh, I called surrealistic comic, where I asked all of the contributors to basically do non-linear comics. Don't tell a story, just draw comics that look like comics, but don't necessarily make any sense. Stream of consciousness was the idea. So the one I did started out with this splash page, which is also uh, an original hanging in the uh, exhibit and I'm told the museum actually has produced a jigsaw puzzle and a, a mouse pad of this image. So if you want a souvenir, uh, here's a possibility. So I just went wild with this, went crazy uh, drawing this uh, image. And then the following pages also look superficially like comic panels. In fact, uh, at one point it says suddenly halfway through page two. But what happens doesn't make any linear sense. And uh, the last page is uh, no more traditional, but it was great fun drawing it. And I have to say, this comic sold as well as the comics that did tell stories. So it just makes, it kind of confirms the theory that most of our readers were probably on some kind of drugs when they were reading it anyway, and maybe they couldn't tell the difference. Anyway, it was a great fun as a experimental trade-off. 
I moved from Milwaukee to Princeton, Wisconsin in 1973. Princeton is a small farm town in Green Lake County, west of uh, Ripon and Oshkosh and Fond du Lac. I bought a 10 acre farm and I converted every building that was on it. The main barn eventually turned into this with, uh, with siding and uh, uh, wraparound porch and so on. And inside were all of the offices as we steadily grew. Uh, Kitchen sink peaked at about 25 employees and uh, we all fit into either this barn or a separate warehouse that was built uh, out of uh, sight of this. And um, at one point I did a page uh, called Rural Publishing, which also uh, tongue in cheek sums up my move to the countryside. I'll show it to you panel by panel. Uh, and number two Swamp Road, by the way, was literally my address. I didn't make that up. Another day begins, <clears throat> visiting artist says, and that's not all. I got to have more. This royalty isn't enough. After all, I got a name. And I think to myself, this guy doesn't look so tough. Listen, you'll take what I give you and you'll like it. <clears throat> yes, 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 he says. Meanwhile, I'm pleading with a printer. Please, please say you'll print our books today. We've waited six months. We'd appreciate it. Oh, thank you, you goddamn bastard. No lunch for the wicked. Why can't you... God damn French, understand simple American. It's in the contract. You have to pay us. P-A-Y. Oh, Jesus. Things just aren't simple anymore. Yeah, simple. Used to have flowers in my hair. Put out two books a year when I felt like it. Ate brown rice. Grew veggies. Yeah, I'm going for a walk. Smell the roses. Yeah. This guy doesn't look so tough. So again, making fun of myself. Self-deprecating humor among the best. Another influential guy I met who I had been a fan of for many years was Stan Lee, famous Marvel Comics editor and eventually publisher. Stan and I had been pen pals for a few years, and he kept, strangely enough, asking me to come to New York and work for him, but I didn't want to move to New York and I was having too much fun doing my own thing. But midway through 1973, Underground Comics went through a real crisis. We call it the crash of 73 for complicated reasons, kind of our own recession. So as the belt tightening was taking place, I called Stan and I said, you know, let's, let's talk about your offer. So I flew to New York and basically I told Stan I did not want to move to New York but I would produce uh, an experimental magazine for him if I could stay in Wisconsin and uh, accede to certain demands, like we want to keep our copyright and trademark and keep our original art and things that Marvel didn't normally do. And to my astonishment, he agreed to everything. And I ended up producing uh, a magazine called Comics Book with an X. It only lasted five issues, but it came in very handy because... Uh, during that uh, period of time when the market was tough for undergrounds, uh, Marvel paid me and the contributors far more than we were normally making. And uh, we had virtual complete freedom. And Marvel was printing 200,000 copies of each issue, which was about 20 times more than our average print run, and getting it in newsstands across America. So. It allowed underground cartoonists to suddenly have exposure that they wouldn't have had in the normal head shop uh, venue that was typically where you'd find us. So working for Stan ended up being a good thing, but again, I was glad it was a short-term thing. Later in looking back at it, I did a page I called Working in Geek Town, in which uh, that's me walking into the Marvel office completely straight and normal. And as I'm... Uh, Walking in, I see everyone who works there is very strange and uh, not exactly human. And as I'm working there, gradually I start to turn into a geek myself. And so what I was really saying here was if I had decided to go to New York and work for the man, I think I would have morphed. I would not have been a hippie. I would not have been a free spirit. I would have suddenly been 
breaking all the rules that I had set up for myself. So in hindsight, I was glad I got to work for Stan for a, a little over a year and glad when I got back to so-called normal. I continued working uh, with the uh, Bugle, doing covers, doing uh, some art direction, doing the strips. This is a cover for the uh, fifth anniversary issue, which was a very rare full color cover. Normally we couldn't afford more than two covers. So this was special, we splurged. And uh, you can see here even Milwaukee's Finest are helping uh, light the candle for the uh, Motley crew that's attending the uh, celebration. I show this one because it wasn't always uh, uh, cake and roses. Uh, the uh, Bugle office in 1975 or 76 was literally firebombed by culprits who were never caught, never punished, remained a mystery. Um, I uh, had just been in the office two hours before the firebombing, working on the following image, which was a logo for a, a music column called Plastic Donuts. So I left it on the uh, editor's desk and drove back to Princeton. By the time I got there, I got a hysterical call from uh, one of my uh, fellow staffers uh, crying basically that the office was on fire. This miraculously made it, you can see it literally has uh, stains from the smoke and the flames licking at the edges. So that's my souvenir and my reminder that working in the underground press um, has certain dangers and they, they can't be ignored. Speaking of horrors, um, I briefly did a series called Weird Trips and this one features Wisconsin's favorite cannibal homegrown cannibal, and remember, we have more than one, uh, Ed Gein. This is drawn by a great artist named uh, Bill Stout, with uh, Ed Gein uh, dipping into a stew with contents we don't really want to think about. On a more fictional level, I produced a horror series called Death Rattle. This is a cover by uh, Charles Burns, went on to considerable fame. And this is a death rattle cover by a guy named Frank Miller, who you may also have heard of from Dark Knight and Sin City and such. I also always tried to give a venue to women cartoonists. When I started, there weren't that many women in the comics field. It was male dominated. The underground venue opened up the doors though to everyone. And Trina was one of the earliest and one of the most prominent of the women. Among other things she did, I gave her her own title, which uh, she here, you see the title looks like Trina's Girls, but Girls has been covered up by women, of course. She also complained to me that some of the uh, erotic comics that the guys were doing to her were not erotic at all. They were sexist and offensive. So I said, fair enough. Why don't you put together a group of women, do your own erotic comics? And so she did. We called it Wet Satin, Women's Erotic Fantasies. So this cover by Trina shows her eating a banana while she's ogling, uh, I believe that's Marlon Brando in the doorway. Also decided in the late 70s that there ought to be a venue for gay cartoonists who were also just not visible, very, very few and virtually none in comic books. I asked Howard Cruz to edit this series, which he did uh, wonderfully. And this first issue is a cover by Rand Holmes, best known for Harold Head. And here you literally have a gag uh, of, a, of a guy who is still in the closet. This is a cover I did for a series called Energy Comics uh, for a friendly rival called Edu Comics. My alter ego, Steve Krupp, who you saw earlier, he's kind of my capitalist stand-in. He's shown here as a ruthless capitalist who is force-feeding uh, some kind of synthetic fuel to the uh, baby who is wearing the uh, ecology bib. I also did a thing <clears throat> for the uh, state of Wisconsin uh, Department of Consumer Protection called Consumer Comics which was distributed to all of the uh, high school seniors uh, in Wisconsin in 1975. 
Uh, this covers by Pete Loft and myself, and inside it's me, Loft, and Pete Poplansky. And it's uh, entertaining uh, excerpts of actual consumer laws that the state wanted to be read by seniors just on the verge of becoming legal adults who could sign a contract at age 18, and basically warning them about a lot of traps that unscrupulous businessmen use to take advantage, especially of young consumers. So that was a fun project. Speaking of uh, Wisconsin-based things, I continue to stay in touch with many of my classmates at Racine Horlick High School. And every 10 years or so, when we had a reunion, I would be tapped to do the uh, cover. This is the one for the 10th anniversary, in which uh, uh, it's still funny to see that the class president turns out to be a hippie from classmates who haven't seen him in the ensuing 10 years. Um, jumping ahead, this is the 40th anniversary one, which I'll break into easier panels to read. Classmates who were fashion trendsetters 40 years ago are still turning heads. <laughs> Crosstown rivalries die hard. Me and Pete toilet papered Park High School last night. Stole their old mascot, too. Awesome. Go Rebels. A few of our star jocks might have slowed down just a little bit. I can still do a mile in five days. But four decades later, the class of 64 can still party hardy. Bartender, Metamucil on the rocks. Three Viagra. Give me a prune juice. Make it a double. And the most recent one, the 50th, shows the class of 64 still rocks. I don't know if there's going to be a 60th, but if there is, I know I'm going to be doing the cover and I've got to come up with a new gig. So I want to end this with a uh, uh, another kind of tongue-in-cheek autobiographical one I call Square Publisher. I did this in uh, 1995, I think, for... Um, an anthology I published called Blab, which was edited by Monty Beauchamp, who uh, was also in Chicago when I was at this point in Northampton, Massachusetts. And uh, I'll break it down by panels too. Call it The Square Publisher. A page for Blab, Monty, I'm a publisher. They don't draw anymore. Can't. You see my... <laughs> my, my pencil is flabby. Blab is an edge mag. My edgy days are over. I get panel fright. The light bulb doesn't light up anymore. I'm allergic to ink now. Did I mention that? Can't even think at the office. It's a zoo. Monty, you're just going to have to get a real artist. Meanwhile, it shows me sitting at a board meeting of Kitchen Sink Press uh, with a chart showing that Kitchen Sink uh, totally dominates the comics industry market share with very small slices for Marvel and DC. So you can see it's all completely honest and truthful. So on that note, I'm going to uh, end the slideshow and uh, see if Tyler has any uh, questions. Thank you so much, Dennis. That was a, a fantastic overview of a very illustrious and wide range. I'm sure that everyone is uh, clapping privately at home. I can't I, I, hear them. Yeah, you know, me neither. I do have some questions and should reiterate that we also welcome questions for anyone who's out there listening and watching. If you just put your questions in the comment sections, it should pop up here and I'll read them off. But to, to kick things off, I'll ask a question of my own. Um, Dennis, I was hoping that you would talk a little bit more about uh, your own development as an artist. Uh, you'd mentioned early on in the presentation that back in the day there were no schools for cartoonists that you could go to. So I'm interested in, in basically how you learned. I've talked with uh, Pete Poplaski about this and he would tell me that whenever he had a dime, he'd go buy a comic and then he'd take it home and he would put white paper over and trace it. <laughs> and then he would draw the tracing. And then once he could draw the tracing, he would try to draw it from memory. And, and that, as both you and I know, and anyone who's seen the exhibition, turned him into one of the great comic yeah. mimics. Um, your style is really uh, unique. There's no one that quite has anything like it. So while you might not have Pete's versatility, 
you found uh, a really distinctive voice. So how did that come about? Were you copying Weird Mysteries and Little Lulu? <laughs> um, I have a conscious memory at one point when I was, I think, maybe nine or 10 years old, the Milwaukee Journal Green Sheet had a contest and basically it invited kids under 12, I believe, to copy their favorite Green Sheet comic strip and to send it in for a contest. And my favorite strip at that time was Little Abner. And I tried to copy Little Abner and Daisy May and General Bull Moose and so on. That was really hard. I gave up. But Nancy looked easy, so I copied Nancy. And uh, Nancy, uh, to this day, is still uh, haunting my subconscious. I didn't win the contest, but it was the first conscious effort of copying. Pretty much I was self-taught. And I think for a cartoonist, it's one of the few professions where you don't have to go to school. You can teach yourself. When I did go to college, I decided I would major in journalism because the other half of cartooning, of course, is writing. And I thought journalism would be the way to really learn the most succinct, direct writing style, kind of the inverted pyramid where you start with what's most important and you write in a, a crisp style that gets right to the point. So I don't have regrets about that. I'm glad I went to college, glad I got a useful degree in journalism. And between that and being self-taught, I jumped right in and never looked back. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Ernie Bushmiller and Nancy as being the comic that you could draw. And um, I noticed the, the one influence, direct influence at least, from another cartoonist that I see in your work are Bushmiller's uh, sight lines. <laughs> in Square Publisher, when you're, uh, the light bulb doesn't light up anymore, there's a dotted line that leads there. Uh, and I associate that with Nancy. It might have been used yeah. by... No, no, I... I I, I think Bush Miller is an amazing cartoonist. He's very underrated by most people who look at it, and they think it's very simplistic. It is, in a sense, but every line is there for a reason. It's extremely geometric. Its compositions are perfect. In many ways, he's the epitome of a cartoonist, and I know I do get arguments on that, but the, uh, I think, which Webster's Dictionary at one point, if you looked up comic strip, there was a little Nancy in there as an example. So uh, Miriam Webster, someone agreed with that. Yeah. All right, well, so we have some questions that have come in, so I'll toss them your way. Mike Martin would like to know what cartoonists you admire these days. <laughs> these days? Well, we already talked about Ernie, and uh, I, uh, there's no point in talking about the classics. I would say um, I'm... Uh, I try to read a lot of contemporary artists. Eleanor Davis is a favorite right now. I just read a couple of books by Meredith Gran. I love anything Charles Burns does. Crumb's not prolific anymore, but I'll still read anything he does. Um, I try to keep one foot in what's contemporary, and uh, my youngest daughter, who is an avid graphic novel reader, helps guide me sometimes because there's no local comic shop. But I also, there's a library I have of many graphic novels that I want to reread or read for the first time. So the good news is there are so many things coming out these days, no one can possibly stay on top of it. It's, it's really a surplus of riches. And uh, anyone who hasn't paid attention in a while really needs to go to a good comic shop or a good online comic shop and check out the seemingly infinite choices. Okay. Uh, Leslie Luttrell would like to know Ernie Bushmiller versus Al Cap, which is your favorite to bring to new audiences, or maybe just compare and contrast the two heavyweights. Well, it's funny because I would say as a storyteller, they're, they're really doing two different things. Ernie Bushmiller is a gag-a-day kind of cartoonist. Al Cap told stories, episodic stories, often outlandish with cliffhangers, and so they really pulled me in because every day growing up as far back as I can remember, that was the strip that I would read because it was beautifully drawn. But every day it left you wanting to know what happened the next day. And it would be infuriating, especially on a Saturday when you had to then skip Sunday, which was a different continuity in the Sunday paper, and then Monday pick up the string. So 
Cap was a master uh, of that. And I have to put an asterisk on that because while I admired him as a cartoonist and I still think he was a genius, as headlines later revealed, he was not a perfect human being by any means. He ended up being what we would call today a sexual predator. And I ended up with uh, Michael Schumacher, a Kenosha writer, co-authoring a biography of Al Cap in which we tell the story of his career warts and all. And there are plenty of warts, but it still was an influence I can't deny. Okay. Uh, just going in order here, uh, one Doug Ains would like to know how Dennis Kitchen can be such an amazing piece of cheesecake at his advanced age. <laughs> your secret to uh, vitality, I guess. Comics keep you young? Yeah, being at the drawing board and the monitor keep you out of the sun. That's the key. Don't, too much sun. I will say uh, that a lot of my contemporaries and classmates I've noticed have a lot more wrinkles. So I'm either just lucky and I have good genes or I've stayed out of the sun. Um, someone would like to know, what do you want to see in comics in the future? You know, I want to continue to see them evolve and to continue to have the same kind of respect that literary works do. And, and I, I say that in the context of not every book is literary, not every cartoon is art, but the best of any field is worthy of our attention. And I think people who maybe never took comics seriously have started to recently, or at least they, they, they will see reviews in the New York Times or New Yorker or other respectable publications that do take graphic novels seriously. So what I want to see is that people are attracted to the field who might have otherwise become a painter or a writer or a screenwriter. But today they might say, I can combine all of those and I'm going to make comics and I can do it myself. I can also collaborate. But it's one of those mediums that still, um, I think, has got a lot of unexplored corners and the potential is unlimited. Excellent. Someone asks, uh, what do you think of the children's books that are now going comics? Um, there seems, the Babysitter's Club seems to have a, a comic version now. Take it this is a trend. Absolutely. And Raina Telgemeier is selling millions of books. She's probably the best-selling cartoonist in the world right now. And people who read Superman and Batman probably never heard of her. Um, children, and I would say also the YA, what we call the young adult field, there are some amazing comics being done. Beautiful. I buy some of them just because they are so beautiful, and I don't care if they're aimed at a 10-year-old or a 14-year-old. I love seeing good comics. So it's another example of how the genre is unlimited. Uh, there are comics out there for all ages. You know, again, you can be a preschooler and there are comics for you. And uh, you can be uh, retired. You can be in your 80s and 90s and still find comics that will appeal to you. Uh, there are comics that are autobiographical or biographical or historical or surrealistic, new versions of Mondo Snarfo. Very personal comics uh, seem to be the norm now. Uh, there are a lot of uh, self-referential comics, and that's fine. Anything can become uh, too self-referential or ultimately boring. I like to see people who are breaking the rules, and uh, I like comics that are on contemporary themes. Right now, there's so much crazy stuff going on in this world. I want to see what cartoonists are experiencing, how they're seeing the world. And some of it might take a year or two or several years to percolate, but this whole pandemic year, I guarantee you're going to see countless comics about it. And some are going to make you laugh in spite of yourself. Some are going to make you cry. And we need both. Absolutely. Someone asked your thought about current working newspaper cartoon commentators. I guess the, the current state of editorial cartoons. Do they mean editorial or do they mean comic strips? You think? Cartoon uh, commentators uh, well, with a political bent. Well, let me address both because uh, editorial cartoons are really a, kind of a second cousin of comic books and comic strips, but they're very important too. 
And they're, instead of a gag a day, they're kind of the commentary a day. And the best ones are are still great. Uh, I I don't even want to name particular ones. There's a lot of good ones that I see regularly. Um, comic strips are the traditional uh, newspaper comics, the kind of classic four-panel format. And newspapers, unfortunately, are slowly dying. I hope they don't die, but they slowly seem to be. And as a result, comic strips are not as vital as they used to be, and there's not as many out-and-out geniuses. But there are a few. I still love uh, Mutz by Patrick McDonald. I love uh, Zippy the Pinhead by Bill Griffith. There's a new one called Macanudo by Linears. Uh, who's an Argentine cartoonist that's amazing. So there's still, on every level, in every format, including newspapers, there are great comics to look for. And if you don't find some of those in your favorite paper, because they usually have a budget for only a dozen or so, the good ones are collected, and you can find them in books. You just have to go online, type their name in, and you'll see collections. So... There's no excuse for not finding the good stuff. Sure. What are your thoughts on Japanese manga, considering that at bookstores they seem to outnumber graphic novels? They do, and um, they seem to be very popular, especially with the 14-year-old girl set, not not to totally pigeonhole them, but they're not my cup of tea. I I don't like the the big eye look. It's annoying to me. I, I, there, are, there are some Japanese cartoonists who fortunately don't draw the big eyes, but that's most of it. And most of it's a little too, I want to say science fiction-y and just culturally not my cup of tea. But that said, you can't deny they're hugely popular and you just have to walk into a Barnes and Noble and see that probably half of the graphic novels available are manga. Someone's asking about Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics that, that Kitchen Sink published. Um, what, what was your experience with that book? Well, it's great. Scott McCloud was someone who actually tackled and dissected the medium itself, which was great because even a lot of cartoonists who instinctively made comics weren't necessarily self-analyzing the structure of it. So what I loved about it was on every level, Scott basically uh, explained what comics are, what comics do, how they do it, why they do it, and encourage other people to do it. Um, so yeah, I was very pleased to, to publish that one. He ended up doing a couple of uh, a follow-up books too. So he's he was a very important voice in uh, the new generation of cartoonists. Okay. We have someone asking about um, Jim Carrey's work. I'm not sure whether this is Jim Carrey, the actor, or Jim Carrey <laughs> that I'm aware of. Jim Carrey would be a different kind of comic. Yeah. Um, if it's a cartoonist, it's not ringing a bell, and I apologize. That's okay. Um, someone said, so uh, in your presentation, you had mentioned some of the the innovations uh, in terms of publishing that Kitchen Sink was a part of in terms of um, gay comics, wet satin, uh, women's comics, Twisted Sisters. Um, someone is asking about black cartoonists past and present. There have been um, not as many as I think there ought to have been, but even way back in the 40s, there were some prominent black cartoonists. It was even in the 1940s, uh, it seems awkward now, but there was a Negro comics by all black cartoonists and somewhere in the mid 1940s. But um, during the time I was publishing, there was uh, one regular contributor, an African American named Richard Grass Green. Grass was his nickname. And uh, he had a solo comic called Super Soul at one point, and he contributed to a lot of our titles. There were a couple of others that just didn't stick around, and I'm not sure why. Uh, the door was always open. The truth is, keep in mind, this was in the pre-Zoom and Skype days. I'm working in central Wisconsin. I have no idea what most people look like who are sending me letters and submissions in the mail. I don't have a questionnaire that says, what race are you? So there could have been cartoonists that I published. I have no idea what race they were. The door was open. And it still is. And fortunately now, 
I think um, in terms of both comic books and comic strips, there are more creators. I think they're more welcomed. And uh, I think it's overdue. No question. Someone is asking about Dan Burr, your old colleague, Dan. Right. Burr. Dan's Sarah. amazing. Dan is one of the, along with Jim Mitchell, the last cartoonist standing from those days. Dan is absolutely amazing. Uh, he illustrated two all-time classics called Kings in Disguise, and the sequel was called On the Ropes. I uh, published the first myself, and, and uh, they're now in print from W.W. W. Norton, and I recommend them the highest possible recommendation. You as well as Will Eisner, as well as uh, Alan Moore, there seem to be universally faded works. Um, yeah, absolutely. I would recommend almost anything by Will Eisner. You could start with his Contract with God, which really revolutionized the field in 1978. It was the first modern graphic novel. Alan Moore wasn't far behind him with Watchmen and many others. Um, there are so many touchstones that could be named. Again, we don't have enough time here. We take a series of talks, Tyler, mm -hmm. on, uh, on subtopics, but well, I'm glad someone brought them up. Um, someone just mentioned Will Eisner again, wondering about his role in pioneering the graphic novel. So let's dig a bit deeper into Will. Yeah, he was talking about as far back as 1941. And I wouldn't even, you know, if Will told me himself, he believed in 1941 that comics potential would be as a literary art form. I would have said, yeah, sure, Will, and been a little skeptical, but there's a newspaper article quoting him in Philadelphia in 1941, so it's indisputable, but nobody was listening, and there was no opportunity to market what he had in mind. It took him basically over 30 years, 37 years, before he uh, his own vision could come true with Contract with God. And in the time he had left, he basically did a graphic novel every year for the next 20 years. And the majority of them are wonderful. I especially recommend uh, A Life Force and uh, 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 Heart of the Storm are a couple of favorites. Well, um, maybe just I'll ask one last question and, and we'll call it a day. So uh, over these 50 years that you've spent in the industry, what are the major changes you've seen? How have things improved for the better and how have things changed for the worst in, in other ways? Well, the good news, we'd start with the fact that there are two comics exhibits right now in your institution in Wisconsin. When I was beginning, it would have been inconceivable, I think, to, to go to a museum and expect to see original comic art. So, so among the in the good column is comics are starting to get respect and cartoonists are at some level being seen as legitimate artists. Um, and uh, the same is true in terms of, I mentioned earlier, getting reviews in places like the New York Times and the New Yorker and places that you would look to for reviews of first-rate literature. So those are positives. The fact that there are now a couple of thousand or so comic shops in America, some of them during the pandemic, I'm afraid, are going to go extinct. But there are outlets um, where you can just walk in and see nothing but comic books and graphic novels wall to wall. That didn't exist when I was starting out. It was another fantasy. Um, the fact that we have um, a situation where the industry went from having its own censorship committee, the Comic Code Authority, to now a situation where artists are unfettered. Even at the big companies like Marvel and DC, they're relatively lax about what can be done. It's not to say they aren't censored in some way, but the cartoonists and the writers are given a lot more latitude what they can create and present to the readers. Um, on the downside, I would say um, the dissemination of comics, the distribution, uh, continues to be a problem. Those shops I mentioned um, are still built around what we call the floppies, the the comic book they used to be, the dime when I was a kid. Now they're three ninety-five and up. It's uh, 
it's not something that's attracting a young audience. And I think if they don't shift to concentrate more and more on graphic novels, they will be gone with the wind. Meanwhile, the big box stores like Barnes and Noble only carry bestsellers. So it's also not a place to find things by indie creators. So I'm most concerned that really wonderful works by offbeat new indie creators and small publishers are going to have a tough time finding the marketplace. And so I encourage people who love that work, who are want to discover it, to use, use that internet machine and really diligently track down the best things. Look for things that, for example, get Harvey and Eisner award nominations or things that are recommended by many, many columnists that you can discover. There's a whole network out there of people having dialogue about comics. You need to find someone whose voice uh, is, fits in with yours. And then do your best to support, especially the indie stuff, because the Superman and Batman collections, you know, they'll always find their way into the mass market. But what's really important needs the effort of individuals to support, uh, both by reading them and by paying for them. So those are my final words on the subject. <laughs> Dennis, thank you so much for the time. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you so much for proposing the exhibition and working on it along with Jim and myself. Uh, I hope that everyone who's here will come see the exhibition, which is open through November 22nd at MOA in West Bend and MOA DTN in St. Kate the Arts Hotel in downtown Milwaukee. Uh, we've produced a, a lavish 250 page catalog that has high resolution images of all the works in the exhibition, as well as a work by comics historian Paul Buell and an essay by co-curator Jim Danke on the life and career of Dennis Kitchen. So uh, I hope to see you all there and, and thanks again. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>